Welcome everyone, I'm Madeline DiNono, CEO of the Gina Davis Institute. And with us as always is Andrea Luss, our ASL interpreter. And if you're not seeing Andrea, you may want to change your Zoom uh, to a gallery view so you will be able to see all the speakers. And we're going to have a multi-part session like we have in the past in a moment. Uh, Gina Davis will give us some opening remarks and then Dr. Caroline Heldman, who leads our research, will present our study and then we'll have uh, a panel. So today's topic is beyond checking boxes, inclusion versus exclusion in global advertising. So thank you again. We really appreciate your support. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Gina Davis, who is the founder and chair of the Institute and also an Academy Award winning actor. Take it away, Gina. All right. Thank you, Madeline. Uh, thanks to everybody so much for joining us today. And I want to thank our esteemed panelists today for taking their time to be with us. Um, as so many of you know, or some of you may know, over the past two years, we've achieved something incredible uh, that we've uh, discovered through our research at, at our institute, which is that uh, we have actually achieved parity, uh, gender parity, with the lead characters, both in children's television, TV made for children, and family rated films. So uh, this is one of our biggest uh, goals from the beginning, and uh, we're certainly thrilled for progress as well with uh, supporters and also underrepresented. Uh, what happened? Somehow, oh, there you are, you're back. There I am, somehow or other, I went completely away. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so um, uh, anyway, we are so honored to have uh, Ken Lyon as our partner and uh, proud to bring you an in-depth look at the updated work submitted to Ken Lyon. This is the third time that we have been able to conduct and present this, uh, this type of research. And in a minute, you'll hear from Dr. Caroline Heldman, as you heard, and uh, she's going to present those findings for us. Uh, in addition to the research, we brought together an amazing group of experts today to discuss what we are not only seeing in global advertising, but uh, what work is being done to improve those images. Um, in addition to the research, uh, right, you'll be hearing from these panelists. And uh, again, I wanted to thank uh, Ken Lyon for being an incredible partner and being at the forefront of systemic change. And again, thanks to all of you members who are here today with us. Our work can only continue with support of like-minded individuals like yourself. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Gina. And without further ado, we'd love to bring on Dr. Caroline Heldman, who leads research and, inst research and insights for the Institute. And she's actually gonna walk you through this latest update. Take it away, Caroline. Thank you, Madeline. Uh, it's always a good day when you can wake up and talk data. So for all of my data science nerds who want to know about the methodology or more about this study, please go to our website and check out this same report, which is posted there with much more detail. Um, it is my honor to present the largest study, public study, of advertising and diver diversity uh, sponsored with, uh, partnered with Can Lions. And I will say Susie Walker has really been the driving force behind this in Madeline de No No. Um, they have established a benchmark. So this is the benchmark study for how various identities are represented in advertising. And we know this because the industry cites it and uses it all the time. So I'm gonna be presenting data from 2006 to 2019 with the focus on 2019. Um, our methodology, just a quick overview. As with all of our studies, we mix machine learning with expert human coding. We run the GDIQ, which provides data on automated screen time and speaking time. Uh, for this, we analyze, for this particular study, we analyzed an additional 251 advertisements. And this is in addition to a data set from over a decade 
that is already uh, over 2,000 uh, parts. So a nice representative spread from 13 years. We analyzed six identity groups in this study. Uh, I should note that this is the very first public advertising study that actually looks at all six of these identities as we now do at the Institute. So we're looking at girls and women, we're looking at BIPOC, we're looking at LGBTQ plus characters, characters with disabilities, um, older adults ages 60 plus, and characters with large body types. So let me jump right into the data. We'll start with gender. Our major findings when it comes to gender, um, just to anchor it first, 51% of the global population are women. Um, and we anchor it globally because this is a study that actually has about two dozen countries advertising from about two, do two dozen different countries. So the global stat is 51%. That's what we're comparing it to. As you can see, male characters still outnumber female characters two to one. And we have made some progress over time, but not much. You can see that the progress um, is, goes up and down, but still remains around two to one. Uh, we find the same thing with screen time and speaking time, that male characters are on screen and are speaking about twice as often as female characters. Uh, but there has been some improvement. In the past year, for girls and women on screen, uh, we've seen a 7.4% increase in their presence. And when it comes to speaking time, a 5.7% increase. So a little silver lining or a little positive finding there. Um, when it comes to how characters are portrayed, we find that gender stereotypes persist. Um, male characters are more likely to be shown as working, they're more likely to be shown as leaders, and they're more likely to be shown as funny than female characters. And when we look at how female characters are presented, um, the persistent stereotypes of women as sex objects remain. So uh, women, uh, female characters are four times more likely to be shown in revealing clothing, twice as likely to be partially nude, three times more likely to be visually objectified, which is something that the camera does, and six times more likely to be verbally objectified, which is something that other characters in a particular ad would do. Um, when it comes to race and ethnicity now, shifting gears, um, we actually don't have a global anchor, and the reason for this is twofold. First, a lot of countries do not uh, gather information on race, so we can't tell what the global percentage of people of color is. But secondly, and more importantly, in terms of how we interpret our findings, um, a lot of uh, countries actually don't see um, race in the same way. So for example, who would people of color be in India? Um, and so what we see here is um, anchoring it to the US population, 38% of people are people of color. Um, the percentage of people of color over time has dramatically improved, um, but this is actually, uh, and, and it's now up at where it is in for the US population. So we've seen about a 10% increase in the past decade. And in fact, we find that characters of color get more screen time than their numbers would indicate. So some positive findings there for race. Um, but when it comes to race, we also have some negative findings for stereotypes. Um, in 2008, characters of color and white characters were equally likely to be shown as smart, but we actually see a gap emerge in 2019. And if you look at the small numbers down below, the reason that white characters are more likely than characters of color to be shown as smart um, is because we have fewer depictions of characters of color as being smart in 2019. Um, Moving on to other uh, race findings, uh, we find that white characters were more likely than characters of color to be shown working in 2018. We also find this same racial gap in 2019. Um, now zeroing in on the representations of black people. Um, black people are 14% of the US population, but what we find in 2017, 2018, and 2019 is that their numbers are higher in these ads um, than uh, represented at least in the US population, which is a positive finding. Um, what we also find though is mixed findings in terms of black representations, um, that white characters are more likely to be shown as professional in, in an office, um, and black characters are more likely to be shown as funny and while you wouldn't think this would be negative, it actually plays into stereotypes of Black people um, as entertainment in media, um, and that's a persistent stereotype that we want to shift. 
um, when it comes to now an intersectional analysis of race and gender, um, we find that uh, you know two to one black characters are male versus female. Um, something similar to what we found overall with our gender numbers. Uh, so black women are vastly underrepresented in advertising. Um, and then when it comes to uh, gender stereotypes, looking at that intersectionally, black women are seven times more likely than white characters to be, sh uh, white women characters to be shown as visually objectified. Again, that's what the camera does. And four times more likely to be shown as verbally objectified, uh, which is what other characters in the ad would do. Um, now turning to LGBTQ plus findings, um, LGBTQ plus people are 10% of the global population, but fewer than 2% of characters in ads. Uh, this is a, a, a decrease from the previous year, so progress is not steady, it is not being made on this measure. Um, we also know that LGBTQ plus characters are less likely to be shown as working and less likely to be shown as smart as non LGBTQ plus characters. So it's not just an issue of underrepresentation, it's also an issue with the way LGBTQ plus characters are being represented. Moving on to disability, um, here at the Institute, we measure uh, three types of disability and character representations. The first is physical, the second is communication disabilities, and the third is cognitive disabilities. So 15% of the global population has some form of those of, of physical disability. Um, the number is higher for uh, other types of disability, although a global stat does not exist for that. And what we find is that very, very few characters in ads are represented as having some form of disability. However, it slightly increased over 2018, which indicates some progress there. Um, we know that when characters with disabilities show up, uh, they are far more likely to be depicted as smart than characters without disabilities. So this is a strong positive. Um, turning now to older adults, um, we know that people ages 60 plus make up 19% of the global population. So one in five people on the globe is ages 60 plus, but in the ads, uh, only 7% of characters are ages 60 plus. When they appear, um, they are more likely to be shown um, or less likely to be shown in an office. So uh, the idea of being a productive member of society is less available to older characters and ads than younger characters. Um, we do find one negative and two positive find additional findings. Uh, the negative finding is that uh, characters ages 60 plus are uh, about twice as likely to be depicted with physical comedy. So oftentimes their age will be the punchline but we find very positive representations in terms of older adults being shown, more likely to be shown as leaders and more likely to be shown as smart. Um, turning now to our last point of analysis, uh, people with large body types make up 39% of the global population. And here at the Institute, we measure body size using a five point scale. It starts with very skinny, then goes to somewhat skinny, then average size, then somewhat large, then very large. And what we do is we take the somewhat large and very large, the, the last two categories, we lump them together into one category that we call large body types. So that's what these stats are based on. So again, uh, two in five people across the globe um, have a large body type according to um, health and government data. Uh, what we find is that only 7.2% of characters have uh, large body types in advertisements. And when they show up, they're more likely to be depicted as working than people with other body types. However, 15% of them are shown as lazy in the workplace, which reinforces a very negative stereotype about people with large body types. And in fact, we find much evidence of very damaging negative stereotypes for people with large body types. Uh, we find that they're more likely to be shown as stupid in an ad. They're more likely to be depicted as eating or drinking. And in one in five ads, their weight is a punchline. So um, obviously something to focus on here. And in terms of interventions with gender, uh, the number of girls and women is actually about where, uh, well, there much, much room to go, uh, but higher uh, than it has been in the past. We need to cast more women and sexualize them less and show them as funny and having authority more often. Uh, for race and ethnicity, we need to write characters of color um, as intelligent and as professionals in scripts. For LGBTQ plus characters, 
there's a vast underrepresentation here. And when these characters are presented, they're presented in less positive ways than non LGBTQ plus characters. With disability, um, the representations are actually great when they actually show up, but we need to write and cast more characters with disabilities. Um, and then in terms of older adults, uh, we need to write and cast more older adults, ages 60 plus, and make sure that they don't just show up as a punchline. Um, I really want to focus on this last point of body size. We did find uh, a really high depiction of damaging body size stereotypes. So first, cast more people with large body types in ads. Um, and second, make sure that, that these depictions are not reinforcing very damaging stereotypes of people with large body types as being lazy, stupid, or a punchline. Um, so that is the data, and it is uh, my honor to now turn it back over to Madeline DiNono. Thank you so much, Caroline. So clearly we could see that some progress is being made, um, but not enough. And to have a more in-depth conversation to hear what's happening in the industry and also some best practices, we're going to turn to our esteemed panelists. So I'm going to ask them to pop on their cameras, uh, starting with Susie Walker, who is the head of awards for Can Lions. Thank you, Susie. Uh, next, uh, Doug Freeman, who is the president of Global Reflections Inclusive Leadership and Practices at Beauty World Group. Welcome, Doug. And then last but not least, our alpha partner, uh, Mackenzie Thomas, who is uh, Product Marketing Management, Equity, Inclusion, and Diversity at Google. So uh, thank you so much um, for joining us. And so Susie, um, some people may or may know, not know our story, uh, but we've had the privilege of being partners uh, with you since you know, 2015. And Right away, you know, Can Lions um, raised their hands and decided to, you know, jump in in a big way. So, what what was that spark? Um, why was it so important for Can Lions um, not only to launch and fund this research for now three years in a row, but to just look at all the other initiatives you've been doing, which people who are at home may not know all the things that you're doing towards um, equity and inclusion. Yeah, sure. So um, nice to see you again, everyone. Um, so well, we at Camlines, we know that marketing actively shapes culture and society, and we have a kind of unique position in the industry. And obviously we have access to decades worth of data and creative work. And of course we are one of, if not the biggest platform the industry has, and we kind of take that position really seriously. Um, in 2015, we launched the Glass the Lion for Change, and that's an award that specifically rewards creative work that addresses the misrepresentation of gender in marketing communications and at that time it really helped accelerate the conversation across the industry and um, we were thrilled when you Madeline came and um, took to the place of the jury president for the glass lines in 2016 and um, we had a lot of good conversations at that festival and the following year we co-presented and funded the first study um, of hard data concerning gender representation of, in, in advertising and um, we looked back at 10 years worth of work and I mean you'll remember as I will that it, it was a really shocking results that actually there'd been no improvement at all and we were mainly looking at women in the representation of women um, since 2006 and that kind of acted as a bit of a wake-up call for the industry um, and so we kind of committed to carrying on funding this research and fueling this conversation um, in the industry and Cut to now, where we are now, we've got this intersectional report um, and sometimes in the way that only data can, you know, you can't, it really highlights the issues that you kind of can't argue away. Um, and then in terms of kind of what, what we are doing, other things that we're doing, obviously we had to cancel the festival this year for obvious reasons, um, but we'll be back in 2021. Uh, for the Can Lions Festival, we'll be celebrating two years worth of work. So we'll be awarding two years worth of Glass Lions. Uh, we also have another award, the Sustainable Development Goals Lions, um, that celebrates work that con contributes to those aims. And we donate the entry proceeds for both of those Lions to charitable initiatives, including funding 
uh, research like this, but we also do quite a few other things. So we um, talk to our jury. We have about 300 of the world's most successful creative and business leaders on our juries. And we always ask them to consider um, whether the work that they're awarding perpetuates inequalities of deep rooted um, stereotype, stereotypical portrayals. And we know that those conversations kind of carry on outside of the jury room. Um, just a couple more things. We have our See It Be It program, which is in partnership with Spotify. Um, it's our initiative aiming to achieve uh, gender, equal gender representation actually in the industry and the creative directors and leaders. Um, and this week we launched uh, See It Be It podcast. It's free to download. Um, but the kind of main thing that we're doing at the moment in, in lockdown in the pandemic is we've actually launched an enormously successful digital platform, um, Lions Live, and we actually launched it during the festival dates this year. And it's open to everyone and free combination of live stream content on demand from creatives uh, across the whole branded communications industry. And um, we're always working on more. So kind of watch this space um, for what we're up to next. So Susie, for um, our, our members who may um, not have been to um, Can Lions, for the digital platform, uh, can anybody access? Can they sign up and, and get in for free? Yeah, it's absolutely free to everybody. You do have to fill out a really short form just saying who you are. Um, and then, yep, you can have access to all of the content on there. Um, it's free and open to everybody. And just to say, the content is amazing. Uh, it's just a, a wide range from world leaders. And one thing before I, I throw to Doug for our next question, um, Elizabeth and Lisa are monitoring our uh, chat. So if you have questions along the way, just throw them in there and then we'll get to that um, in a little bit. Um, so Doug, so we, we're seeing some progress, not enough, prog mm -hmm. not enough progress, and we know what happens behind the scenes directly influences what happens um, on screen. So Susie was talking about, you know, this wake up. Um, mm -hmm. It's one thing to be woke and, uh, and it's another thing to actually do something. So mm -hmm. from a trend standpoint, um, what are you seeing um, in terms of progress? Um, and, and can you point to anything in terms of what's working uh, mm -hmm to get more diverse and inclusive people in the pipeline in order mm -hmm. to see the work reflected. So if you could just give us a sense of what you're seeing industry-wide. Sure. sure, thank you, Madeline. And uh, thank you, Susie, as well, to build and connect to those points. Certainly, uh, and this is a global phenomenon, it's not US-based, EMEA, uh, we are trying as an industry to diversify the pipeline and diversification takes time, and it has multiple elements. Uh, they're the early phases, uh, you're looking at sourcing, uh, it's getting people ready, it's getting people into the pipeline, it's keeping them in the pipeline in the industry, it's developing them and advancing them to leadership positions. And whether it's uh, our industry specifically, advertising media, uh, right now, as you can imagine, in our current state of affairs, there's a fair amount of um, outcry, to be honest, to diversify, particularly at the middle levels and the top levels uh, with more diverse talent across all industries. And the outcry is pressing and organizations are being forced to look at diverse talent differently as many organizations, some of those who we're working with, are bringing in different talent uh, to top level positions and giving that talent, perhaps for even the first time, an opportunity in key leadership positions. Now, overall, as we want to try to have a, you know, we don't want this to be a one and done or a one time moment for preaching to all of our clients, the notion of sustainability. Uh, what's our game plan? How are we going to build talent, not just for today, but for tomorrow? Because as we all know, our demographics globally are rapidly changing. And that's not stopping anytime soon. So uh, regardless of our moment in time, the trend remains that over the next 30 years in particular, uh, we'll have a more diverse population in terms of age, in terms of gender, sexual orientation, one big bucket, race, race ethnicity, and immigration will be a huge uh, source of talent diversification. 
So overall, we try to suggest people look at this holistically. It's a big pipeline. And the challenge has been that it hasn't been inclusive. And we have to really think very closely how we make these pipelines inclusive, how we make pipelines work on a gender basis, race, and others at all steps. And that is a life cycle. It starts from your sourcing. Where do you go for talent? Everybody should ask a fundamental question. Where do you get talent? Uh, it can be now starting at how do you engage talent at high school level, community college, vocational colleges, other sources and pools of diversified talent that perhaps are not your quote unquote go to sources of talent. You've got to look beyond and go to untapped pools of talent. And as you go along those processes from onboarding, and here's a real basic one ask the question for your internship. Is it only perhaps people of a certain economic level who can support their children for an unpaid internship where a lot of kids in diverse backgrounds, rural, don't have that capability. Well, if you can't even get that internship right, which is the source of getting you in the door to a lot of these roles, how can you possibly expect to get the rest of the processes right? So I know this is a, a very uh, vibrant and it's a major issue, but it's an end-to-end -end pipeline. We call it from sourcing all the way up to succession planning, and it has to be sustainable. Thank you, Doug. And I'm going to come back to you in a little mm -hmm. bit to ask you for um, some case histories and best practices. Sure. So uh, Mackenzie, um, we've been partners with Google since you know, 2013, and we thank you so much for your support. And um, like what Doug was saying, um, Google has taken a very deep and similar look um, at your own ads, uh, similar to what we've discussed. What are you seeing? Are you seeing any change? Certainly. Um, well, firstly, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, so at, at Google, as Madeline, you just mentioned, we have been looking over the last few years in particular um, at all of our own content. So um, there's a, a handful of other folks who help with this very, very robust uh, process and gathering really, you know, thousands and thousands of uh, creative pieces from, you know, banner ads to videos. And then we really, you know, analyze um, everything frame by frame. Um, and in aggregate, some of the things that we've seen um, in our own work is not all that different than what um, Carolyn shared earlier. Um, so we are, and we're actually just in the midst of going through the data from this past year. So I'm doing a little bit of a retrospective back from 2018, early 2019, um, but hopefully it still sheds a, a you know an important and interesting light. Um, so yeah, we were seeing that you know women were um, present more and more within our work, but really you know still not at that at least 50% uh, rate. They were women were not speaking um, as, and not getting as much you know front screen speaking time as um, their you know, male counterparts. Um, we were also seeing, of course, um, you know, unsurprisingly, the fact that when women were shown, it was predominantly white cisgender women too. Um, and then digging you know, deeper into how, you know, Doug, you, you mentioned the point around race and, and folks of color. Um, and we really wanted to make sure that we were understanding that in a, in a more nuanced level too. So in, you know, in, within the US, we were seeing that actually the black community were um, represented over the rate uh, at, of the US population, which we, which, you know, we deem as something that's awesome and, and really great. As we begin to dig, dig a little deeper though, we were seeing that you know, over um, a third of representations were actually um, in a more stereotypical manner. So seeing um, the black community within sports or entertainment or singing and dancing. Uh, and we really wanna make sure that we're you know, mitigating those stereotypes as well. Um, within the Latinx community, we, the representation was slim to none. Um, and that's kind of a really, you know, f alarm bells are going off as a key thing that we need to be um, more intentional about. Um, and then, you know, digging a little bit deeper as well into um, other, you know, uh, forms of identity. So LGBTQ representation, um, something that we were seeing were that 
predominantly when we were showing folks within the LGBTQ community, it was either during uh, Pride, so there were lots of, you know, rainbows and it was feeling a little bit rainbow washing. Uh, so how can we show up and, and celebrate, you know, this community um, throughout the entire 12 months of the year um, as well? And how can we make sure too that we're not only centering, um, you know, the, the voices of queer, white, cisgender um, men uh, in particular. So we need to be, you know, diversifying as it relates to gender, as it relates to race um, at those intersections of LGBTQ representation. Um, and then also, you know, looking at the disability community, this is another space where we know that we need to do a ton more. We need to be really intentional about that too, um, acknowledging that you know, when we're centering the voices and the presences of folks with disabilities, it should um, not just be, you know, people who are in wheelchairs. That was kind of where we were seeing teams kind of run to when they wanted to highlight um, the disability community. But there's so much diversity within any, all of these communities that we're touch, touching and talking about too. Um, so how can we make sure that we're celebrating um, underrepresented voices within these communities too and, and acknowledging that, you know, in, in different spaces, different people are marginalized and underrepresented, but we really need to dig deeper and not just, you know, do what's what's easiest in the short term um, as well. Thank you. So I'm going to go back over to Susie. So building on what Mackenzie said about um, it's one thing, you know, people need to show up, but it's another thing for us to really um, institute systemic change. We have to be in it for the long haul, and clearly, Can Lions is in it, you know, for the long haul. So I know that you have a specific point of view on interventions and recommendations. And I was wondering if you could share, you know, your point of view on that, because for this next round of questions, I really want to talk more specifically about um, specific interventions, specific, you know, initiatives. So, um, so Susie, maybe you can walk through kind of your point of view on what, what Can Lions is recommending um, for the industry. Oh yeah, you're on mute. I was on mute, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, sure. I mean, I think, yeah, so the 2017 study was really treated as a, as a wake up call, but actually, you know, we haven't seen any improvement in front of the camera. And um, so I think, you know, we need to be looking at what's behind the camera um, really and what's happening there. Um, and, you know, my sense is that industry has changed gear in the last couple of years from kind of lip service to action, particularly around racial diversity. But, you know, we, we'll see. Um, so I kind of have like two hopes. So one is this understanding of who's behind the camera is actually kind of more important than who's in front of the camera. So who's making the work and sort of every step along the way. So from casting, production, strategy, you know, everyone from leadership to, to everyone at every level, um, kind of there being diversity and inclusion um, in brands and agencies. Um, and also this thing of, you know, we've seen a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of noise about diversity and there's been some really amazing, brilliant kind of flagpole campaigns. But what we haven't seen is that that kind of shifting into the bread and butter work across across everything. And, and I think, you know, part of that could be that diversity and inclusion has been seen as a sort of add on. Um, and actually really to see real change, businesses need to kind of address that at the core um, of what they do. Um, for sure and that's that's also kind of what we've been hearing at lions live so we had a session by we are pies alex bennett grant who was actively calling out racism in casting and production we know that casting um, and production there's there, there's a lot of issues there with who is chosen to kind of be on the ads and the way people are a cast um, as Mackenzie was saying um, and then Diageo who've done a ton of work on affecting diversity in their leadership but also challenging their brands um, their, their, sorry their creative partners to uh, to address diversity and inclusion there um, and then there was a really brilliant session by Shaftesbury um, on queering the script um, and they were talking about um, really authentically engaging with these kind of intersectional underrepresented groups um, to actually sort of connect with them rather than it being a tick box or 
um, you know, a kind of clunky um, campaign or a piece of work, that it actually they kind of go and speak to those communities and those people are included in the creation of the work. And, and all of these conversations we just weren't hearing two years ago. Um, you know, and the intersectional nature of it, obviously there's centuries of discriminatory forces, it's not going to change overnight but I think studies like this with data that you can't argue just always kind of push the conversation forward and we're really committed to to kind of working with partners and the industry and using our platform to kind of push that push that forward um, and so it's you know always a real pleasure to be able to actually produce something and, and get out and talk to people about it so um, so thanks again for kind of working with us over these years uh, on this. So Susie, God willing, we can all be in person together. Are you <laughs> going back to your original dates for, for next year? Yeah, we've already got the dates. I wish I had them off the tip of my tongue, but it's third week of June uh, in Cannes uh, next year. We will be there um, uh, as long as something doesn't happen to kind of get in the way of that. But as I say, you know, we have taken this opportunity to kind of pivot and, and change what we're doing. We've got the Lions Live platform now and um, we plan on doing more kind of live versions of that and using that platform to connect with people and um, and share content and ideas and conversation and debate around areas such as this um, on there. So please do check us out. There's lots of content on there now and you can sign up for to hear about what we'll be doing in the future. Thank you. So Doug, I want to go back to what uh, you were saying. Um, we were talking about being in it for the long haul mm -hmm. and you talked about um, pipeline and sourcing, but um, you have a methodology yes. that you've instituted at um, Uniworld and mm -hmm. you talked about, aside from all those other things, there's assessment mm -hmm. and accountability, right? Because it's one mm -hmm. thing to say, okay, I'm going to talk to high schools and I'm mm -hmm. going to, you know, get on a list and whatever. So can you really talk about your specific practice sure. at Uniworld of what you've instituted, your protocols, mm -hmm. and can you talk about what has worked um, mm -hmm. for you, and if you would like, because <clears throat> we know you've worked with everyone from Disney to MLB to Morgan Stanley, mm -hmm. if there's any specific results that have come out sure. of um, this practice, if you can share it with everyone sure. here who may be able to take something away mm -hmm. and institute it into their uh, company. Thank you, uh, Madeline, and uh, uh, just trying to connect the discussion, so so many wonderful points, but to the process, um, unfortunately for initiatives, there's been a lot of great passion, a lot of goodwill, uh, people with uh, open hearts and open minds, but um, uh, unfortunately results haven't been there. And so what we've found is uh, like many activities in many organizations, uh, there has to be a real high level of commitment as a grounding. And then there has to be a, a you know, high level system. And we try our best to convey, you know, a takeaway of sorts around the system to make it as straightforward as possible. So to your point, I'll lay out, a, we call it our three A's. It's a, a relatively straightforward thing to, to learn, but it's a very, very hard thing to do. And you've mentioned one of them, you know, in this time, especially acknowledgement and assessment, and particularly that assessment piece, is so critical for organizations, whether you have five employees or 50,000, you've got to figure out where you stand, particularly if you're trying to diversify your organization or impact your work output that impacts this industry in the world. And from that solid First step is the action piece, because you're going to get guided when you can assess effectively, you will find out what the priority is, you will find out what the appropriate implementation action should be. The hardest piece by far, and we all know it, and you've said it already, is accountability. And most organizations are just, are just hard pressed to have the commitment that they need. Uh, measurements, and this is what unfortunately you have to measure your outputs or to the best degree that you can. And you've got to have resources 
uh, to get to those accountability levels. So if you're trying to diversify, Susie mentioned behind the camera, Susie's spot on, and Mackenzie as well, those process steps, they're not easy. It's hard. It takes time. It takes a lot of coordination. It takes a lot of effort. So when you look at that at least macro system for any organization of any size, at least you can place yourself into that system uh, as you start your process of trying to make impact. So that's one you know, critical systems piece that people have to look towards. Um, I'm going to give another piece because a lot of folks do ask the question, well, you know, we want to do the right thing with diversity and inclusion. And we, we want to have impact. But, but where are we going with this? Is this? We hear the term journey. Is it going to take just forever? <laughs> we try to give some type of map. And also, it also serves as a little bit of an assessment. And any organization can ask themselves. And we call it a five-point scale, diversity 5.0. The 1.0 universe as an organization is really just about compliance. Uh, they'll do something around diversity, but they're really appeasing regulators or trying to avoid lawsuits and just going about their business. A 2.0 universe starts to look at your workforce and your workplace and gets pretty serious around diversity and inclusion. The, the things we were talking about, pipelines that are not working, you really start to put that into your organizational plans to correct those situations. You try to build cultures we call it inclusion, engagement, and high performance. And then, of course, your outputs, your product, and what you're providing to the marketplace, and how inclusive uh, is that product or, or the customer or client base you're trying to serve. So you're looking at the 3.0 marketplace world and examining that. And of course, 4.0, we talk a lot about diversity of thought, but do you really have that and do you really leverage that? Because that's innovation. A 4.0 world leverages diversity of thought, but it's not just an idea creation, it's decision making. You know, does unconscious bias, for example, get in the way of making strong or effective decisions in an organization? And when it doesn't, how do you intervene? And ultimately, we want to get to a 5.0 universe where diversity and inclusion is part of your DNA, it's integrated into the organization. It's a part of everything you do. It's a part of your plans, your operations, your people, your marketplace, how you think. So that's another high level. You know, any organization of any size, you should ask the question, where are we on the five points? If we want to do this, where do we stand? Or do we think we're 4.0? Maybe you do. Maybe parts of your organization are really good at that. So those are two um, tools that any size organization can take away to what works. Um, a few, there are a lot of organizations that are doing well, and, and I will even talk to the ad industry because we're seeing a lot of changes. Our organization uh, is uh, a minority owned firm, but it is a part of a much larger organization that many of you know, WPP. And so I can speak just in the WPP world, we've had the opportunity to see a lot of transformation. We are, and I don't think it's just us, I think publicists and many others will be doing the same. We're starting to put diversity inclusion at the beginning or the front of the creative process. We're making it core to the advertising brief before it's even built, right? Because if you're not thinking about a DNI lens at the very beginning of the creative process, how might the process break down from there? So it, we're front ending our DNI lenses and our capabilities and making it core to everything we do at WPP on a move forward. And that means diversification of teams. So now, not just Uniworld, but Uniworld is leading the efforts across all of our major industry, agency industry partners to build globally diverse pipelines. And I'm very proud. We're making very aggressive movement. When I say aggressive, we're close to, I think, uh, even having top-level positions. And top-level means a CEO. There might be a CEO or two that may not look like the same old, same old CEO. And we're, we, we know, from a Uniworld perspective, we've at least diversified many more of the C-suite pipelines already in a very short period of time that are going to get us impact. So I'll stop there to say 
you know, I wanted to give you real industry example. WPP is actually through this effective diversity model, scaled, uh, inclusive leadership training that we are co-leading across all of our major industry. We're talking for over 100,000 leaders, even before the end of the year. We're pushing DNI transformation, as I believe, and I know I can speak to publicists because I've heard of some great work there, and I think others in the industry are doing the right thing to make these impacts now and in the future. Thank you, Doug, and let's hope uh, when we're all at uh, Can Lions next year, we can see this great output yes. as, as a result of Absolutely. that. Absolutely. So, um, so Mackenzie, I wanna go to you, and then we're gonna go to questions, everyone, so rally up your questions. Um, you know, one of the things that we've noticed um, from some of our partnerships, even most recently with the licensing industry, is that, you know, Doug laid out a great five-point scale but one of the key things he said is resources commitment, which means it can't just be words. There has to be financial support to support the initiatives, right? Um, and I would love for you to talk about um, your inclusion marking initiatives because that does require commitment and resources and um, that you have launched and the impact um, of any, of any of those programs that you'd like to uh, share with us. Certainly. And there's a, there's a couple of little nuggets that I think from what Susie was saying and then what Doug was referencing as well. I think, you know, we, we talk about this very, very long uh, journey, um, but that's both a, you know, a journey within the context of a project, but also of course, like the broader societal journey as well. And I think as we, we just, if you know, look at the creative process, for example, that brief stage, historically people were, you know, asking the question of, oh, is my cast inclusive, right? And a little bit of what we were even referencing earlier around the data, like does reference that piece in particular, like is that, what is the cast of the, an ad or a movie actually um, reflect? But we need to find, you know, much earlier in that brief stage, and even before that, of like, what's the research insight that's actually going into um, that brief? So um, if, you know, we're talking about, obviously, Google is a product and engineering company. So if we're talking about uh, Google Maps, for example, who actually are your users? Um, who are, how do different people, how do different communities use those products? And how do you bake that into that um, creative brief process as well? Um, so then before you're, you know, casting folks for that spot, you actually have um, an inclusive brief um, that you're actually like rooting it into insights that a community um, feels compelled to connect with that brief, you know, with that brief and then with that creative process much, you know, later down the line too. Um, and every decision, like we took, we joke a little bit, but literally every single decision that's made needs to be looking at this through the, the lens of uh, inclusivity. So um, who is on your team? Um, to Susie's point earlier, like if the folks in the room are not necessarily uh, representative of the community that you're trying to, you know, work with and center, then like, what are you doing about that? Um, and are you, you know, partnering with an external organization? Are you partnering with a creative agency? Um, how are you actually making sure that the work is representative and the team is representative of um, the community, whether that's the U.S. or, you know, more broadly too, or a specific you know, brief for say pride or, uh, you know, uh, black history month or something of the sort. And how do you, if you are bringing that external perspective really, uh, and truly like championing and valuing that perspective, paying people as well. That's another thing too. Um, like don't just ask someone for their insights and say like, what do you think about this? But like pay those partners, pay those community partners, um, and then value that insight just as much as you would, a you know, director or VP, et cetera. Um, so with some of the you know different resources that we've built, um, some of this has been top down and others been bottom up, and it's actually been a nice combination um, of how we're seeing progress being made. So a couple of things that I'll call out: one, um, we do have our a training that all marketers go through when they join Google, and then as they develop as well. It's a, a, not a very catchy name, but it just it's our inclusive marketing training that walks through a lot of those insights and really how do we ground ourselves in, in truth um, and in equity as we move through that creative process. Um, so everyone goes through that training and starts a lot of really 
you know, important conversations. And we're also scaling that as well and doing that with our agency partners too. Um, and that, you know, partnership and, um, and teamwork is necessary for us to do this work because so much of our work is reliant on creative um, agencies and brand agencies to, you know, develop this, you know, the next Super Bowl spot or the next uh, Olympics, you know, program. Um, and with that, how do we make sure that everyone's really on the same page as we, you know, embark on that? Um, and with that, you know, we're certainly investing more and more into um, black owned, Latinx owned and um, women owned um, creative partners there. So that's one piece. And another piece that I'll call out is our inclusive marketing consultants group. Um, and this is a group that over the last couple of years has really grown tremendously um, in size and in, in value to the, to the company as well. Um, it's a group of folks across Google, um, across marketing, who are you know, just due to their you know, individual representation and identity historically underrepresented in the creative spaces. So we as a group review content um, that teams will submit, maybe it's an ad, maybe it's an email, whatever it might be. Um, and we review it and look at it really uh, and you know, formatively through the lens of um, equity and through the lens of inclusion. We then provide feedback, prioritize feedback, um, P0s, P1s, P2s, uh, and we bring that back to the team. And if things are not acted on, they actually do get escalated. Um, so the you know, VPs and SVPs will actually pull ads and say, you know, this is not representative of um, how we should be showing up um, with a community, for example. Um, and through the years, we've pulled ads literally like days before the Super Bowl, which I think is actually a huge win. Um, oftentimes, the inverse happens where something goes out and you're like, oh, you're cringing um, or you, you know, you, you wait until it hits the Twitterverse and then all of a sudden you're hearing, you know, that these decisions that we questioned a little bit early in the process actually uh, should not have been made. So um, the value of, of that group is, is immense. Um, and, you know, there's a ton of other uh, systems as well. Um, you know, tons of partnerships that have been made with our agencies, um, you know, tons of partnerships that have been made also with community partners to really push us ahead with research groups um, like yourselves too, uh, to make sure that we're, you know, doing the right thing, acknowledging also where we need to do better. I think that that's another thing is we're very, we're a data-driven company and thus we're like very realistic about places where we need to make that change too. Um, so that's a quick like, you know, look behind the curtain as to some of the things that we're thinking about. That's really, really impactful. So now um, I'm gonna invite um, Dr. Caroline Heldman to come back on and then Elizabeth Kilpatrick who leads our uh, development operations is going to curate um our question so elizabeth i'm going to throw it to you all right so we have a question for marianne helen doug can you talk about the importance and impact of black owned ad agencies and content creators when it comes to representation in front of and behind the camera absolutely thank you for that question um uniworld and i kind of briefly mentioned i probably didn't say it clearly uh multicultural ad agency it's the oldest in the country, 51 years old. And it was founded by an African-American male. And in 2012, Monique Nelson and her family purchased 51% ownership. And so it is owned by an African-American female. So it is a black owned business. Uh, it happens to be also partially owned by much larger, which has uh, for us a lot of benefits as well. Um, not for, it's not for everyone, but for us, it works very well. Um, one of the things, you, as you could imagine, is uh, with Affinity Networks, we've had the ability to take best-in-class black talent and bring it and leverage it and develop it in ways perhaps that not every other agency could. And so we have some creative minds who have been in other places, a lot of big or majority places, who've had an opportunity from a cultural perspective to get some level of support uh, that has allowed them to thrive. And what I've seen from that development piece, and development is very important, and we know the agency world is very fast paced, uh, is that you're getting the best, you're not getting just a black owned agency or multicultural, and what we're finding is that you're getting a best in class agency offering best in class talent. And that's primarily because I wouldn't, 
say it's the it's not the blackness of it it's the cultural development and commitment that has been placed and we do have a couple hundred leaders and we're growing at a pretty rapid clip and a lot of black creators want to be an environment sure they want to have a part of a great large agency as well but what we're finding is the talent is coming to us really for that development really to, for optimization for personal strength for creative development uh, for leadership and that talent uh, is very well positioned to leave to go to other big organizations so it's not just sticking around and having to stay there so i would i would say that's one of the biggest pieces that ability to optimize the talent has been a, a, a major i think competitive advantage for us um, secondly when you're part of a much larger network and not all black owned businesses have the access to major corporate scale i think it is a great competitive training ground uh, you always want to have I, I mean everything is competitive in business you always want to be the best but i think uh not to take a sports metaphor but yeah maybe a little bit of a chip when you're showing being the little kid on the block you want to show all your big brothers that you do well and i think uniworld has a great it's nothing bad about it it's a very uh passionate view of advertising and we uh, espouse an excellence level that we only seek to achieve ourselves. And I think being in that competitive environment allows us to compare and contrast. If we see gaps, we can easily amend them and do better. Hopefully we're performing at much higher levels. Uh, and uh, we built, we, you know, we're built inside and out. We're one of the few agencies that has not only the external view with multicultural, but the group I run is the internal comms as well as internal change management and transformation as well. So it's a very power, it was a very powerful engine pre COVID and pre all the civil, civil disruptions. And now it's an absolute, I view it as an absolute necessity model to drive, you know, best in class support services for anyone in the world. Thank you, Doug. Uh, and I wanted to let you know, Doug, one of our viewers wanted to thank you specifically for talking about the challenges with internships. Sure. So, um, yeah, that's a big thing. Mackenzie. Um, I was just going to say that I think, and I've been, you know, on, on this kick, especially recently, is that we just need to ban unpaid internships. Um, that, you know, in, in every, in every field, uh, in, yeah, whether that's creative, whether that's, you know, uh, within communications, sports, whatever it might be, um, we like see the impact of that. And, you know, I think we, uh, yeah, that's, that's my, my current rant of the last couple of weeks with a couple of folks outside of, you know, tech and, and the agency creative space is just, you can't do it. And rant. And one of the things, Mackenzie, I just wanted to touch on was we, the Institute did a big evaluation of YouTube ads with Google. And mm -hmm. I think one of the things I was wondering if you could talk about what we found out about um, the impact of diverse storytelling in those ads. Yeah, thanks. Um, so really to the point, we were seeing that when um, women were represented at the rate that um, they should be. Uh, we actually saw that people were watching the ads longer, that watch time increased. Um, and obviously that's like the, you know, everyone wants that. You all, you know, everyone wants the, the ad to be watched to the end. Um, and whether that's a six seconds ad or the 15 second, et cetera. Um, so if, if nothing else, we're, we're seeing that, you know, when people do see themselves on screen, that they want to watch. Um, and we touched upon this a little bit around the importance of both quantitative um, and qualitative. So not only how many people are shown, but also how they're shown. What's that portrayal look like too? Uh, it's not enough to just see yourself um, as it relates to gender, race, um, sexual orientation, disability. Um, and of course the intersections of those, you know, super important, but also what does that portrayal look like? Um, you know, is it something I'm a queer woman and for so many years I only saw myself in, in like places of shame of like people like didn't want to come out of the closet and all these sitcoms growing up. 
Um, and, you know, then all of a sudden there was this like stark change where it was, you know, more of a celebration. Um, it just felt normal. Uh, and that at least, you know, personally really helped me. So I think, you know, we've all probably had one of those stories or like nuggets of like you really seeing yourself on, on screen in a way that feels both positive, authentic and real. Um, and the more we can do that, the more it, it helps both us as individual people, but it also helps the business, right? It's that intersection of both what's good for the world and what's good for people, what's the right thing to do, and also what's good for business. And obviously, you know, at that intersection is where so much good stuff happens. Uh, we have a question from Catherine Halperin. How can diversity and inclusion positions better shift thinking of entire companies in and outside of media? Susie, you want to, you have any thoughts on that? And you're on mute. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so is it how, what was the start of the question? Uh, the question was, yeah, how can diversity and inclusion positions better shift thinking of entire companies in and outside of media? So what's the impact that they can have throughout and how do they do that? I mean, it's kind of, it's difficult for me to answer that one really, because it's not really my total specialist area. But yeah, I think we've seen a lot of um, agencies or companies who have kind of diversity and inclusion offices that kind of sit outside and they kind of act as a, an add-on. And it's about, you know, uh, what we were talking about, you know, it has to be coming from the CEO at every single level and becoming part of central part of the, the culture of the business but it's kind of hard for the diversity and inclusion officers to sort of force themselves on the business so it's it's kind of got to come from the leadership you know from marketing the strategy finance like every single part of the business needs to be aligned that um you know diversity and inclusion is is a priority because you know it just makes business sense as well as being the right thing to do as Mackenzie and Doug have been saying like you know the work that we see um, that has has um, brilliant representation and it is just more effective and it's more successful and um, people feel more brand affinity towards it so I guess I'm not really answering the question exactly you know with the detailed explanation but I just think yeah it's about an entire cultural entire cultural shift I'll touch, touch upon that a little bit too. And Doug, I saw you unmute too. So feel free to, to jump oh, no, in please, please. as well. I think that, you know, th there's, we talk about DEI, diversity and inclusion, um, as many folks for many, many years. And it like really can't just be this like catchphrase of like, check the box. Like I'm going to add this team mm -hmm. or add this person who's now in charge of diversity and inclusion. And we're only going to come to them like, in moments of crisis or you know when we want things to pass legal right but instead thinking about like how does every and you know doug kind of touched you to kind of touch upon this with regard to the you know pipelines and talent um and that is like a, a many many folks jobs uh, in and mm -hmm. of itself right so like having someone who's in charge of diversity equity and inclusion there there's a lens of talent there's a lens of marketing. There might be a lens of product inclusion, a lens of marketing operations, um, finance, like all of these things are different jobs. It's just, you know, need to be seen explicitly then through the lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so I am often like, and this is sort of like how we've structured our teams uh, here within, you know, our marketing um, DI crew. It's one, it's like, this is everyone's responsibility. And until it's truly everyone's responsibility from, you know, someone on their first day, maybe out of college or on an internship to the, you know, senior executives and everyone in between, like this needs to be something that is asked in performance reviews. That is actually a question when you're, you know, on a daily basis of how are you onboarding people? Um, and I'm sure that we can all think of many, many other examples of that too. Um, and then, you know, we have, we structure that it, it's, we have both our like centralized team of, and a few of those folks are actually, you know, listening in today. So um, I will acknowledge that like different people carry very different roles within that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're, we're both like, we come together every few weeks and sometimes every other day even, but we also like sit on different teams and that's really intentional because then the impact is felt more, um, you can feel 
the pulse within that team. So mm -hmm. I sit on the consumer apps team. I can feel more readily like the pulse within how are our products and how are our you know team members thinking about this. And then there's other people who sit more on our brand team or people who sit on our operations team. Um, and collectively, we're able to drive that impact. But if we were just like thrown, you know, in a separate, you know, space, and we weren't able to really like interact with different teams, or we would come in only for a training, or for like a check mark, then I don't think that the impact is seen as regularly, or like as readily rather. Um, that said, like, my goal is that all of us, like we would not have to do this job, because it would just be built into how we all think about our work. Um, we're nowhere close to that. I think we all know, like the research, Caroline, that you shared earlier references that and Doug, so much of what you said as well. Um, but maybe one day we'll get there and like that's that, you know, true like sense of equity and justice that I know that we're all trying to, to uh, strive for. So Doug, I don't know if you wanted to um, add to that. Sure. If not, um, we will... Um, We'll probably close on time, but I did want to give you a chance to respond. Yeah, I'll, I'll make it uh, brief because there's uh, Susie is spot on and Mackenzie is absolutely spot on. You know, if the if you're gonna if the theme is what do you do about DNI, first thing is you got to make it core to your business, core to your, whatever nonprofit business. It's got to be core to everything you do, and that goes to um, it can't be a bolt on, which Susie was saying. It can't be sitting around in HR by itself, and Mackenzie has brought that idea to light that you have to have all these different players from every part of your organization commit to uh, the diversity inclusion piece and how it affects their piece of the organization and then come back together and aggregate, take that holistic view, how it affects everyone. Ultimately, uh, when, you know, uh, we're all sort of responsible for this and diversity is a business driver. People ask, you know, well, how do you show that it makes hard dollars, you know, because it's a tight universe. We're in a tough economic position. And we'd argue that it's core to everything you do uh, for driving value. It is core to your marketplace growth. It is core to the quality of the products and services, particularly the services that this industry provides. And it's core to having the right culture and people. Um, ultimately, you know, a, a quick and simple way is uh, looking for what we call missed business opportunities, but a specific type, missed diversity business opportunity. That's an exercise any group can go through. And that's called blind spots. Go look for your blind spots related to diversity and inclusion. You could be in any part. You could be on the production team. Go find your DNI blind spots there. You'll find one. If you look, people haven't looked before. And when you do, you, you know, you have to identify that. Is it something that's quantifiable? Most of the time it is. And then how do you do something about it? What's the intervention? And if it's monetarily based, you've got to measure the monetary impact. So just go, go find the, once again, any size organization, five people to 50,000, find those blind spots. And you can work on something tangible uh, that can make a difference to your overall organization. Well, thank you so much, Doug. Thank you so much, Susie. Thank you so much, Mackenzie. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Caroline. Um, and I just want to say thanks to all of you, our uh, cherished uh, donors and members. Um, we wouldn't be able to do this work without your support. And I do want to uh, say two things. One, for those of you who posed questions that we weren't able to answer, if you actually identify yourself with your email and not anonymous, we will ask the questions to our panelists and we will email you their response. So that's one. And number two, um, we wanted to let you know that our next uh, event will be in September and we're really going to focus on how um, diverse movie audiences uh, correlate to diverse content on screen in the global movie industry. And that'll be in September with our partner, um, Movio. So we just wanna say, uh, stay healthy and thank you so much. Thanks everybody. <laughs>